Welcome to our Decision Fatigue in Parenting webinar. I am very excited to be here. Um, I'm Jessica Palais. I am a mom of two, and I am the brand editorial director here at Vivi. Um, and I was able to record, so that's great. Um, I am so excited to talk about this very important conversation um, about decision fatigue. I know that everybody is super interested because we got so many great questions leading into this. Um, I'm joined today by clinical psychologist and the author of Mom Brain, uh, Dr. Elise DeBrow DeMarco, and the founder of Not Safe for Mom Group, Alexis Brad Cutler. Um, and the three of us cannot wait to dig in. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to sort of set the stage here. So. Um, decision fatigue for parents existed long before the pandemic. Um, the last few years, though, have like really ratcheted up the stakes. Parents have been forced to make decisions about their family safety, finances, schools, uh, childcare, so much more. Um, stuff that if you're a parent on this call, you know, it literally felt like life and death. Um, we are burned out. I can say that I know that I am um, anxious, overwhelmed. Um, and I can tell you, you know, th as the mom of two girls, my girls are nine and 10. The thought of making another decision every day, it just makes my head want to explode. I, like I'm talking like which paper towels to buy. Um, even the most mundane decisions really feel like they're they're loaded now. Um, and I know that this is true, whether you have, you know, a nine and 10 year old like me, whether you have a baby, whether you have a toddler, a preschooler or a teenager. Um, so, you know, here at Vivi, we know that, you know, childcare is actually a huge decision um, that is stressing people out. And that is, you know, it, it's created so much stress and it's part of why we are here today to talk about it. Um, Alexis told me from Not Safe for Mom Group that she um, has been polling her audience about uh, what, what are the biggest decisions that are creating stress for them. And out of 125 people plus that responded, um, 75 of those answers were related to childcare. So, um, you know, we, we know this is really indicative of, you know, a, a stressor for parents and something that at Vivi were, were very passionate about. Um, so if you're not already familiar with Vivi, I just wanted to take a minute to kind of talk through what we do here. Um, Vivi is on a mission to reinvent childcare. Um, and there's a few ways that we do that. In New York, we have three campuses um, that provide learning and care for um, children ages six weeks through five years old. Um, in select cities nationwide, um, we have a Vivi in-home program that matches families with exceptional care caregivers that bring care and learning um, right into your living room. And finally, uh, for those of you with older kids on this call, uh, Vivi also offers virtual tutoring, um, which has become a lifesaver if you have children that are uh, trying to sort of catch up after the pandemic or just, you know, do test prep or anything like that. So, um, you know, at Vivi, we really, you know, speaking of decision fatigue, we're trying to take the guesswork out of childcare and education. Um, so, um, you know, would love to talk to you more about that if, you, if you're interested. Um, so before we get started, um, I just wanted to share a few logistics with you and then we'll dive in. Um, first of all, I appreciate that so many of you are here today on this call. Um, I know that it was a decision just to join. So um, we thank you for deciding to be here. Um, we have about 45 minutes together. I'm going to use the first 30 minutes to ask our um, to you know ask our panelists some questions, go through a little bit of information, and then um, you know, Certainly the chat function will be open the entire time. So please drop questions in. We'd love to see you know, what you're thinking about. Um, and then we'll use the last 15 minutes to take questions and you know, feel free to, we'll, we'll go through as many as we can here on the call. Um, you know, we, do, we have these awesome experts that are here to answer. So feel free to you know, dig in. Um, I also want to acknowledge that decision fatigue is a huge topic and definitely not something that we are going to get through in 45 minutes. Um, but I promise that you will walk away with at least one practical tip, one thing that you can do from this call. And I think as a parent, um, that's a win. So, um, so hopefully uh, that will help you reduce a little bit of your decision fatigue and decision anxiety. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce our special guest today. Um, so first I have Dr. Elise DeBrow DeMarco. She is a clinical psychologist um, and a writer and she's based in New Jersey. Uh, she specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy for ma maternal anxiety and stress. Um, her writing has been featured in many, many places. I actually found a, a great article about decision fatigue in the Washington Post, um, but also parents.com, Today Parenting, Motherwell, Motherly, Psychology Today. Um, she's also the author of Mom Brain. Um, uh, this is an amazing book. It's Mom Brain Proven Strategies to Fight the Anxiety, Guilt, and Overwhelming Emotions of Motherhood and Relax into Your New Self. Um, so if you don't get enough of Elise today on this call, definitely go buy the book. 
Um, she is joined by Alexis Barad Cutler. Um, she is the founder of Nazi for Mom Group and a journalist. Um, she is a community builder and a moderator, and her work explores the intimate truths within the motherhood experience. If you are not following Not Safe for Mom Group on Instagram, go follow them now. Um, it's a community and platform where moms can talk about all the things that they can't say anywhere else. And they do, I'm telling you, they talk about it all there. Um, and, and really feel like they're in a judgment-free space. So um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute so we can really, you know, see each other. Um, I'd love it if you could start by um, setting the stage for us, um, Elise, and talking a little bit about what decision fatigue is. I'm guessing that there's a lot of people on this call that have experienced it, but might not ever have actually been able to name it. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what it looks like, how the pandemic made it even more pronounced, and like why this moment is really particularly fraught? Sure. So, um, you know, as when you become a parent, there's a lot of decisions you have to make every day for your kids, right? So we're all, and this is this is pre-pandemic for sure. Um, but what seemed to happen, or at least what what I have noticed among my patients, what seemed to happen at the start of the pandemic was that um, we parents started getting all these messages about our job to keep kids safe, right? And it was every day, and it was all around us, you know, it was our job to keep kids from getting COVID. It was our job to protect our kids, et cetera. And I think what that did, at least what I observed with my patients is it created this, um, this idea that we had to constantly be vigilant for safety and health for our kids at all times. Now, not that this wasn't true before the pandemic, but I think it really threw it into sharp relief for everybody. Um, a result of which was that, you know, a lot of decisions that formerly felt minor like, you know, uh, not even related to COVID, like, what do I feed my kid? Um, where do, what do I do in terms of schooling? Can I go to my neighbor's trampoline with my kid? All of a sudden, these decisions took on great importance. It was like, well, th this is about my kid's health and safety. What if the kid falls off the trampoline, right? What if I'm feeding the kid non-organic foods and then they get ill with something? So that seemed to be an, an issue and continues to be an issue. I'll say something too about this, which I found really interesting. Um, you know, one of the things that's become very difficult uh, about COVID, which was not true in the beginning, is that we now know we can't really protect our kids from it, right? Like in the beginning, we were all locked down. So it was like, okay, if you don't leave your house, good, your kids will be safe. Mm -hmm. um, but now uh, we, we can't guarantee that unless we continue to lock down our kids, right? And so I think what's happened for a lot of parents is that they felt like, oh my gosh, I can't control whether my kids get COVID, but hmm, maybe I can control other things, right? Uh, surrounding my kids' health and well-being. And so I think that that's played a part in this too, where it's like, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to focus myself on these health and safety issues that I do have more control over. Where do my kids go? What do they play with? What do they eat? How do you know? They, how do they sleep? I mean, all these kinds of things. Um, so I think that's played a really big role here. Um, in, in now in these sort of the, the year, what are we in year three of this? I, I think I'm. It's a lot of it is about control now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And thank you for that. And I think really, you know, setting the stage of how we kind of ended up here. And I can I can definitely relate to so much of that. Um, you know, I, I'd love to kind of ask you, Alexis, you know, in your role, you moderate like very serious conversations between moms all day. Um, so I'd love to hear more about what kind of conversations moms are having on your platform about decision fatigue. Um, you know, if you can, I know you pulled your audience before this event and asked them what are some of the most stressful decisions that they've had to make um, day to day. Um, you know, what, what were some of those answers and how have these conversations shifted from, you know, before the pandemic or even during the pandemic to right now? Oh, there you I was on mute. Um, so I printed out everybody's answers and it's like pages and pages and pages of responses. And then I looked at, I took like a highlighter to it to see where, what categories they fell into. Um, overwhelmingly, like you said earlier, Jessica, people um, were most concerned about what they're gonna do when it comes to childcare and, and daycare or sending my kid to school, those those were the ones that came up the most. It's like almost every every page is filled with that highlight. Um, you know, weighing the risks and, and also the costs of childcare um, and whether it's worth it to hire a, a babysitter, whether it's worth it to send the kid to daycare, um, that seems to be number one in everyone's mind. Uh, another one 
is feeding. What do I feed my kid? Um, should I have another kid um, or not? Especially given the state of the world right now, um, and and yeah, and whether to quit your job um, to stay at home and that sort of identity wrestling that happens when you just you find yourself in this place, whether you want to or not, um, to make a decision: Do I want to be a stay-at-home mom or do I want to be a full-time working out of the home mom? Or how do I create a schedule that actually makes sense? for me within the confines of my career. Before the pandemic, typically we would get types of questions I had to do with, should I stop breastfeeding? Um, when should I consider um, hiring a nanny? Um, how should I sleep? Should I sleep train or not? Am I a terrible person if I do X, Y, and Z? Oh, also, and should I leave my husband? <laughs> <laughs> Very popular. Um, and during the pandemic, it shifted. We really couldn't talk about anything else except for COVID and COVID safety. Should I leave the house to go to the supermarket? Um, what if I have no choice? I have to take my kid with me. Then what? Um, can we play with people as long as we're 10 feet apart? Like those and everything was evolving as the news evolved. Um, but it reflected directly the struggles, you know, in what we didn't know about COVID. The other interesting thing that happened, though, was that people seemed to form new identities around how they handled COVID in their lives. So you were either a mom who never let anyone into the house ever under no circumstance. I'm protecting my family and putting this, you know, thing in the sand and, and a line in the sand and that's it. Um, and then, you know, judging yourself. I'm like, well, what kind of mother am I if I decide we need to visit my dying aunt and I have to take my family with me. And so there were a lot of those struggles during the pandemic and a lot, and, and I echo um, what was said earlier when it had to do with, um, with a lot of the other, you know, the, the other childcare related issues. Um, and now it seems to be mostly the, the themes that I touched on earlier, which is, should we send our child to daycare? Uh, should we hire someone to take care of our kids? Should I leave my job? Uh, should I homeschool? How the hell am I gonna afford all of this? Um, and then also, how do we get support for kids with special needs or who have medically complex needs? I mean, these are no small things. It's no wonder that we as parents are grappling with this decision fatigue. I mean, these are, it's heavy. It's, it's really heavy just hearing you talk about, you know, the significance of all of that. Um, and then even, you know, I, I saw on your platform, even things just like, you know, what should I make my kid for breakfast? And I don't want to have to decide anymore. I want, I want someone else to just decide. Um, I would love, even before we jump into the next question, if everybody on this call, maybe can just take a minute and type into the chat, like one decision that they had to make today that they didn't feel like making. Like, I, like for me, it was like, my kid was like, can you bring me down clothes to wear to school? And I just did not feel like going up and having to decide what she had to wear today. Um, so maybe, you know, if, if anybody's feeling so inclined um, in the audience, tell me like, what was one decision that you had to make today that just made you feel frustrated? Um, and while, while everybody's chiming in there, um, I would, um, I'd love to, to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, Elise, how this is all manifesting. So let's talk about our mom brains or our parent brains. Um, you know, I'm sure you're seeing more and more patients coming to you with decision fatigue. Um, what is, you know, and, and, you know, also I want to do bring up that this is, it's May, it is a maternal mental health awareness month, um, which is, you know, no small thing and something that we should all be acknowledging. Um, there is so much talk in the news about parenting burnout. Um, you know, I, there are new statistics coming out constantly constantly um, and, and hopefully more attention to it, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily reducing it. Um, I'd love to just for to hear from you, Elise, you know, what is this doing to our overall mental health and, you know, and how is it contributing to burnout? So for sure, I'm, I'm seeing among the parents I treat just a ton of anxiety. I mean, I think that's no surprise. I think everybody's anxious. Um, and, and this, the decision fatigue is, is part of that anxiety and, and part of the, you know, just the exhaustion, you know, we are all experiencing because we're two plus years into this. Um, what I found interesting is it, it can manifest actually differently. And, and this speaks to Alexis, you were talking about, um, 
you kind of characterized as a parent based on like how you handle COVID. And mm -hmm. I thought that was so interesting because that very much um, it dovetails with what I have seen, which is that sometimes the anxiety of, from all these decisions sort of manifests as like over control. So kind of what I was talking about before, like I have got to control absolutely every aspect of my environment and my children's environment and their schedule and our days, right? So sometimes it manifests as over control. And then I guess, Alexis, mm -hmm. those are those parents who are like, I'm shutting everybody out. No one can come in. No one can, you know, can hang out with us. Um, interestingly, though, for some others, it, it comes more in the form of resignation, where it's mm -hmm. like, I'm throwing my hands up. Like, it's been two years of this. I can't do this anymore. But interestingly, the resignation can take one of two paths, one of which is I'm shutting everyone out because I don't feel like making any decisions. So mm -hmm. my decision is we are not engaging with the outside world or the opposite, which is I am embracing the world because I don't wanna to have to make any decisions anymore. I'm sending my kid to every activity, every birthday party, every everything and COVID, if you're gonna come, come and get me, right? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because I think we all have the fatigue but it does manifest differently, again, sort of over control and under control. And even within the under control, do you choose to stop the decision-making by shutting everyone out or by letting everyone in? Mm -hmm. Totally. And yeah, sorry, go ahead, Alexis. I, you know, I'd love to hear like, what, what are you hearing? Are we, you know, are we at a breaking point? Where are moms sort of, where's our, where's our mental state? Definitely at a breaking point. Um, we actually reached that breaking point a year ago. Um, this is like beyond, beyond, beyond. I mean, it's really amazing. Every day, it seems like we wake up to something terrible, uh, something new. And the response I get from my community is WTF. Like, what am I supposed to I just can't even handle it. Like, like my head already exploded. It, my brains are all over the floor. I'm still picking up the pieces. And now you hit me with this new news. Um, so I felt during the pandemic when I was receiving all of the messages from worried mothers to be people who had to um, cancel fertility uh, tr treatments and, and their journey uh, towards motherhood. Um, people had to go to the hospital by themselves like that felt like a really desperate sad time and it got to a point where I couldn't even handle hearing from my community I mean I could but um I physically was ill and and then I had to increase my antidepressants because I was just so weighed down by how heavy the conversations were and then it felt like it took a turn to a more aggressive, you know, who am I in COVID? What is my motherhood identity in COVID? And people seemed to get some strength back because they were so angry. Where the hell is this vaccine, you know? And when's the vaccine for the babies coming and all of that. Um, and then I think we're definitely at that point of resignation, like you were talking about where it's like i can't i can't handle anything more so i don't know what to tell and i'd love to hear from you about you know what you say to the moms that feel like there's just like what do i do yeah this is like such a great seg like obviously we we have a problem here right i think we we have established that so um elise what do we do about <laughs> decision fatigue um and i don't know if you want me to pop into your slides or you just want to talk through whatever um whatever oh, works yeah, i could just talk through it cool so I have, so first of all, I think a lot of this is acknowledging that things are terrible and showing yourself compassion. So this may sound like a dumb, no brainer thing, but I will tell you that a lot of my patients are very hard on themselves for feeling hopeless and anxious and angry. And, you know, will say things to me like, no, I want to, I got to be strong for my kids or, you know, what's wrong with me? I got to get this together. I have to run a household, whatever it is. No, you know what, this is an, a, an awful time, you know, and has been an awful time. So it's very important to first of all, acknowledge that and allow yourself to feel how you're feeling. I do a lot of mindfulness work with patients and have been since the pandemic started. And a lot of mindfulness is just about like being aware of where your head is at any given time and being compassionate towards yourself and allowing yourself to feel what you're feeling and think what you're thinking without judgment. And that's actually been a big piece of this, accepting all the negative emotions that are coming. Uh, that said, I'll share, you know, some of the things that I uh, have been talking to patients about, and there's no magic bullet. I wish there were. I mean, I think a, a struggle that all of us uh, mental health folks have had since the pandemic started is we we can't provide relief 
right? Because this pandemic is out there and it's affecting every aspect of everyone's lives. We are subject to the same stressors as our patients are. So, um, so we don't have magic bullets, but I do have some ideas. Um, so I have sort of two separate uh, strategies that I tend to use with patients, depending on if we're talking about COVID related decision-making versus like the non-COVID decisions. So I'll, I'll throw them both at you. So the COVID related ones, I'm, I'm very big on a CBT strategy, tried and true, old school, looking at the benefits and drawbacks of making a certain decision. Um, I think what's happened with decision fatigue, like I said, is there's a lot of resignation. There's so much anxiety around decision-making that a lot of my patients like won't stop to really think through the decision. So mm -hmm. giving them kind of a framework to do that has been very helpful. And basically when I say benefits and drawbacks of a decision, say you're, you're trying to decide, do I set, do I take my family? Oh, I'm going to use my own example, guys. Do I take my family to Disney and Universal when numbers are starting to rise? This was me four weeks ago. Um, and with a, with a decision like that, you want to consider physical risks and benefits, but also mental health risks and benefits. So the physical risks and benefits, it's obvious, right? A risk is you get COVID, uh, you know, um, a benefit is you don't get COVID, but, but it's basically that that's the, that's the physical risk. One thing I do tell patients though, is that not all physical risks are created equal, right? So there are different, as everybody knows, there's different environments which are more or less COVID safe. So that should go into the decision-making, right? Um, the mental health risks and benefits are so important. And I talk to patients about this constantly. At the beginning of the pandemic, mental health fell way to the bottom, right? It was all about keeping everybody from COVID all the time. And that, that's fine. But now, two plus years in, we are in the midst of a mental health crisis in our country for adults, for children, for teens. We have to think of the mental health ramifications of isolating ourselves and isolating our kids. And so when I am helping patients through decisions, I say, yeah, well, let's talk about the mental health ramifications. Like, should you not go to Disney and Universal, which you and your family has been looking forward to for a year? You know, like, what are the mental health ramifications of that for your children? Should, should you send your kid to day camp or not? You know, any of these kinds of decisions, it's really important to weigh in those mental health risks and benefits too. Um, and you know, there's not a perfect decision. Like I, I, I'll, I'll talk about this uh, more a little bit later, but you know, with every decision you make, there's gonna be some ambivalence and, and nothing's gonna feel totally right, right? But if you've thought through all the benefits and drawbacks, physical and mental health alike, you'll make the best decision for you and your family. So that's the COVID one. The non-COVID one, um, it, and this is about the decisions, you know, anything about like feeding and sleeping and any of those kinds of things that are, are not directly related to COVID. What I have found with all this decision fatigue is a lot of what we call catastrophizing in cognitive behavioral therapy. That means assuming catastrophic outcomes will ensue, right? <laughs> so like, if I, you know, let my kid go on the neighbor's trampoline, she will fall off and break her entire body, you know? Or um, if I don't feed my kid all organic food, my kid is gonna get very sick, that kind of stuff. There's a lot of catastrophizing that comes with high anxiety and that comes with decision fatigue. So with these decisions, what I try to help patients do is decatastrophize. Um, and the way we do that in CBT is we really take a step back and we say, all right, like, first of all, what is the evidence? What are the facts um, that suggest that what we're worried about is gonna come to pass? And what are the facts that suggest that it won't, right? Um, so a good example, I, I, I talk about this and I talked about this in the Washington Post article. You know, I often hear from patients, oh, so-and-so momfluencer or quote unquote expert on Instagram said that if I don't, you know, use this organic body wash on my kid, it's going to mess with their body chemistry. And now I'm worried, do I, do I spend all this money for this body wash? Um, and I'll say, well, what's the evidence? Like, take a step back. I know you're worried, but what is the evidence? Are, are there facts? Is there science to back up this idea that your traditional body wash from Target is going to seriously harm your kid? Um, and is there evidence to suggest that it won't? Um, and with other things too, like getting nervous about letting your kid go play in the neighbor's trampoline, like think about the past. Like, is there evidence that your kid is particularly anxiety prone, you know, ex excuse me, particularly um, clumsy and, and uh, accident prone? Um, is there evidence to suggest that the neighbors um, are really wild and get in scrapes all the time, right? Um, what is the evidence to suggest that this bad thing's going to go down? And what's the evidence to suggest that it won't? And so I think that's a really important question. And following that up with what would be the worst case scenario and what would you do to handle it? Mm -hmm. It's a really good decatastrophizer because you could say, all right, well, worst case scenario, my kid falls on the trampoline and I'll do what I always do when my kid has, has an accident. <laughs> you know, I'll run in and I'll call the doctor and I'll do what I need to do, you know, 
so I think that too is a really important decatastrophizer, right? Is, is to, to ask yourself, all right, well, if I make this decision that I'm scared about, you know, it, it, it could impact my kid in a negative way, like what would be the worst thing that would happen? And let me think through what I would do to manage it. Um, so th those are my go-tos for both the decision, COVID decision related fatigue and the non-COVID decision related fatigue. I ha just have to say for the record, I love the word decatastrophize. I Ew. think I've I think I might start using that all the time. Um, um, I, I know too, you know, Alexis, that certainly if you, if you want to chime in too on other ways that you've seen just sort of more anecdotally, um, you know, kind of uh, your community and, and moms, you know, sort of coping. Yeah, so I don't have like a, a four-step solution or a really great word. <laughs> um, but for, for our moms, um, community was everything. So lack of community was also everything during the pandemic. Um, and people were more isolated than ever. But there are still moms that are feeling that they need to isolate and or at least have a very pared down um, social life. So or there's the moms that missed out on those like the two years of baby classes and they're like, how do I make a mom friend? So I just want to talk about different ways to find community like online mom groups are super key like not safer mom group shameless plug but also facebook groups um try to find the facebook groups where they're not only like selling used baby gear or only talking about you know formula and what age to feed your kid there are so many specific groups and i know meta and everything but you could find your people online. I mean, personally, the people I talk to the most, the times a day, don't live near me or they live in another country. Um, and I feel extremely close to those people because of the virtual connection that we're able to have. And if you are still worried, you know, you, your little one doesn't have the vaccine, you don't want a really big um, social group, pick one friend, like just have one friend. Um, one mom friend can get you through some of the worst times. It doesn't have to be like a person you have everything in common with. It doesn't have to be your soulmate. This is your mom mate. And you, you know, if you could just say to her, look, I have to shower and the baby hasn't stopped crying and I'm just afraid to shower. If that person can come over, you know, you know, you'll do the same for that friend. So I, I think, you know, you don't have to say, how do I make a million mom friends, but I need a friend, someone I can lean on. Yeah. Um, and then pandemic families uh, were another solution that a lot of my moms uh, turned to, finding their pandemic pod and, and really making them part of the fabric of their of their family life. Yeah. And when it comes to caregiving, I, I really can't stress how important it is to find someone who can take your kids off of your hands so that you have some moments alone. There is no prize at the end of the day for being a martyr. You, it is okay to ask for help. It's actually essential that you have some time to refill your own cup. And that can look like having a family member come over, just like, I just need you to come over once. <laughs> I need to get out, right? Or um, do a babysitting swap with a neighbor. Or, you know, the other issue is partners not taking on their share of the load. Um, so, saying we need more this to have more equity let's carve out some times or one time during a week where i go somewhere like an hour walk two hours whatever it is and that's sacred that's my sacred time yeah i love that i mean we talk about that here at vivi too of you know um a, a lot of the moms that i work with or parents i work with they actually add an extra hour onto that child care that is that hour to kind of you know run around and do their thing and and take that moment for self-care um not lining up your child care to be exactly aligned with when you get out of work but allow yourself to have that extra hour and, and really plan for it um that that makes me you know it, it brings me to my next question in terms of um you know Know, decision making support. Um, one of the things that I saw in your polls over on Not Safe for Mom group was who makes the decisions in your family. And, um, you know, in terms of the at least the people following you, I think are generally moms, but um, the the case in terms of what what your polling showed in 99% of the cases, the moms are making these decisions um, or the, this primary caregiver. And um, I would love to talk a little bit about how to get help, like how to, and, and I'm talking not just in parenting in general, but about making decisions. How do you enlist 
uh, your partner or other people in your community to actually help you with some of this decision fatigue. Like I know, you know, I hear a lot of a lot of people that, you know, uh, people in my kind of crew talking about, I wish somebody would just take this whole thing off my plate and do it instead of needing to be managed. Um, I don't know if Elise, you can talk a little bit about that. And certainly I know on your side, Alexis, too. Um, how do you how do you kind of, you know, um, build in in support to, to make these decisions easier? So, I mean, this is something that I, I have talked to moms about since I started doing this work many years ago. So this is nothing new to the pandemic, but it's this idea of how do you get help? How do you ensure that you and your partner, if you, if you have a partner, are carrying an equal load? I mean, we could talk for many, many, many hours about this issue, but I'll just say very quickly um, that what I talk to patients about all the time is as early as possible when you have a, first have a kid, to kind of sit down and write up the list of everything that needs to be done for the kid, for the house, and then to talk very deliberately about who does what. Um, mm -hmm. If any of you are familiar with Eve Rodsky's work, like that's a great jumping off point for this. She has that book, Fair Play, which has cards that, that, you, get, that div, you get divvied up that you know, tell you what your responsibilities are. Um, but basically to have that conversation straight out of the gate and continually updating that conversation as your kids get older, as a pandemic comes, um, as anything else happens, where you're talking about what one person does and what the other person does to make sure that it feels fair. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be completely 50-50 if one of you has a, say, much more demanding job or an older parent to care for or something like that, but it just has to feel fair to both people. Um, and so I also talk about, this is going to sound really funny, but scheduling in regular FaceTime with your partner. I don't mean FaceTime like on an iPhone. I mean like literally sitting down at a regularly scheduled time. I like once a week, although different couples have different preferences um, where you are talking through, okay, what's going on? What's on my plate? What's on your plate? What are the decisions I have to make? What are the decisions you have to make? And that gives you the opportunity to say, hey, look, I can't deal with the baseball. Okay, I'm bringing in my own stuff now too. I'm like they're, my sons are both playing travel baseball. I am dying. <laughs> so like, you know, to, to give me the opportunity to say to my husband, like, I, you need to help me with the baseball. This is like not my area of expertise, right? Um, so I'm, I'm a really big fan of the regular FaceTime. Um, I'll stop there, but one thing I wanna flag, Jessica, to make sure that we get back to uh, is the issue of when are you asking for too much help with decision-making and when can that become a problem? So I just wanna flag that and we'll, we'll come back to it. A hundred percent. Yeah. And Alexis, I'll let you chime in, in terms of, um, you know, a little bit of this, this kind of sharing the load in terms of uh, decision fatigue, and then definitely want to get back to that as well. Um, and while, while we're, we are kind of talking, um, if anybody has questions now, you, you kind of get a sense of, uh, of these experts that we have here on the panel, please ask your questions. Um, if you have a, a certain situation that you found yourself in where you had decision fatigue, um, and, and we can help you to, to workshop that, um, go ahead and throw it in the chat. We'd love to, to start to, to hear from our attendees too. Um, go ahead, Alexa. So Elise, I'm so glad you brought up Eve Rodsky because I was thinking uh, while we were talking, I was thinking about the solutions in her book, Fair Play. And the th one of the other things that I love um, that she talks about within the breaking apart um, different jobs for each partner and delegating, you know, this is yours and this is mine, is that she also says you have to become the pro like the project manager of your job. And that's just everything within your realm. For example, um, I have nothing to do with food shopping in my house. My husband is like super particular about certain foods and he's the cook, which I'm very lucky. Um, and because he cooks way better than me. Um, but when it comes to groceries, I am out of it. Like, don't even send me a, an email from Fresh Direct, like take me off be, because that is your project to manage. It would be weird if suddenly I asked Jessica to come into a Not Safe for Mom group team problem because that's not her project to manage. And so you have to find that project and, and trust that that's going to be handled by your partner in their own way. Not your way, but your own way. I love that. Um, yeah, letting go of control is like, ugh, it's hard, but it doesn't, I mean, you, you need it in order to actually like give a decision to someone else. 
um, a leave up some green space. <laughs> yes. Um, and that was one of the, it's, it's funny you bring that up. One of the questions we got before this is how do I close all the tabs in my brain? I cannot focus, especially with my 283,728 things to do. Um, so I think that that really speaks to that, that this is on people's minds. Um, I would love, Elise, for you to address what you were talking about. And I think it does play back into, you know, when you broke up, when you broke up, when you brought up social media, um, you know, we are influenced by so many different opinions. Um, how do you know when you are, you know, sort of asking for help with your decision fatigue? Um, you know, when, when is too much too much? You know, how, whose opinion matters? Matters? How do you kind of drown out that extra noise and kind of what role does Instagram and this sort of always on social media process play in that? Yeah. So um, one of the issues with anxiety um, and one of, the, one of the things we all do when we are anxious is we do something called reassurance seeking, which we talk about in CBT all the time, right? We, we look to others to give us reassurance that our, you know, what we're, what we're thinking about is the right call. The problem with reassurance seeking is that when we have so many voices, you know, from whom we are seeking reassurance, it is deafening and it's paralyzing, right? And, and I talk to patients about this all the time. So, there, and, and, and I'll say too, the thing about social media is that there are no shortage of opinions about everything. And you've got, you know, quote unquote experts, you've got mom fluencers, you've got people you knew from eighth grade, like everybody weighing in on the same issue with a slightly different take, right? So what I generally will, will tell patients to do sort of as a rule, and this was again, even before uh, COVID started, is like to find both online and like IRL, one or two trusted people who you can go to for reassurance and advice, right? So for people in your day-to-day -day life, I would say these should be people whose opinions you value and whose values you share, right? Maybe they have slightly older kids than you, which is all the better because then they can kind of tell you what you're about to go through. Um, but if there's one or two parents in your life who you feel like share your values, parenting values and otherwise, use those people, listen to their advice. Drown out, if you can, the rest of the advice you're getting from your neighbor, from your cousin who has those obnoxious kids who you think she's not raising well, you know, to anybody else you, you need to recognize, like we say in CBT, consider the messenger who's giving you this advice. And if it's someone whose values you don't share and whose opinions you don't value, that is not advice you should be taking. And those are not people you should solicit for advice. The same thing kind of applies online, actually. Like I tell my patients all the time, like pick one or two, quote unquote, you know, parenting experts, some of whom are wonderful. I mean, the, the interesting thing about the pandemic is that parenting exploded on Instagram, you know, during the pandemic, right? And there are certain experts who are terrific and there are certain experts less so. Um, and so what I'll tell my patients is find one or two experts, mom influencers, et cetera, whose posts really resonate with you and who, and this is very key, don't leave you feeling more anxious after you read their stuff. Very key, right? Take those one or two people and use them as your gurus and try again to ignore the myriad other voices. Um, and the anxiety thing it, to me is, is uh, confounding. Like I, I have patients all the time who will say, oh, I follow this person on Instagram and every time she posts, I'm filled with anxiety. I'm like, why are you following this person? Like this person's making you feel terrible. Why would you do this? Um, and so this to me is a very important thing to consider. Like if if you're reading these posts and they're, they, you, you come away from them feeling guilty or anxious or angry, unfollow, unfollow, or at the very least recognize that this is not a voice you really want to be paying attention to. I love that. Nothing feels better than picking up your phone and doing a little Instagram cleanse and like, and just like cleaning out the feed a little bit. And I agree. That's, I love that advice. Also, there's the mute option. So if it's someone who you're worried would notice that you unfollowed them, like, you know, a friend that's makes you anxious because we still have those people in our lives too like the friend who's always taking a vacation the friend who like bounce back you know after pregnancy like one week later and you're just like oh my god i can't even just mute it and then it won't show up in your feed that's good advice i actually did not know that so thank you um i would love to talk about dd had a great question in the chat here um what are your suggestions for dealing with weaponized incompetence from partners um i think that's like such a great topic i'd love it if either one of you want to chime in there i can chime in there a little bit 
So uh, the weaponizing competence thing is so, so tricky. And, and typically it, it, it's sort of like it, it, both partners are, are often play a part in this, right? So like what I'll see is like, sometimes one partner will start off like wanting to do all of say the kid feeding by themselves. And then of course, what happens is the other partner never gets any experience with the kid feeding. And then it gets to a point where the, the one partner who's good at it doesn't want the incompetent one to do it. And the incompetent ones are like, well, I didn't know, sorry. <laughs> right? I mean, I hear about this all, all the time. And I think it's a complicated, it's a really complicated dynamic. And to your point, Jessica, a lot of what um, moms mostly, um, I, I'm sorry to say, but will tell me is that um, they, they feel very much like, okay, well, you know, I know that I do this well. And if I let my partner do this, they're not going to do it as well. So like, forget it. It's just going to be me. So there's a lot of dynamics at play here. Um, what I say to patients is, you know, I, I talked about having them sit down and talk with their partners regularly about who does what. Um, I say, number one, you guys need to figure out how to play to your strengths. So you may be really good. Okay. I'll take myself. I am obsessive about matching clothing. I don't know why, but if my son's clothes don't match, I go nuts, right? I don't give that job to my husband because he could care less. And I think he's he's probably more normal in that regard. Um, so I do the clothes, but like he does the Cub Scouts, right? So you got to figure out how to play to your strengths because your partner can claim incompetence in one thing or two things, but your partner's not incompetent in everything, right? And there are things that your partner can do that, you know, they may be pretty good at. That's one thing. The other thing is, again, back to your point, Jessica, like being willing to relinquish control, knowing mm -hmm. that maybe your partner won't do it quite the way you do, but also knowing that it will take it off your plate and mm -hmm. recognizing when it's good enough, right? That's another thing that I, I work with patients about all the time. Is I, I, I'll, I'll cite a brief example, which is like, I, I have a patient who recently let her partner plan the kid's birthday party. And she was upset because it, it was not planned to the hilt in the way she would have done it. But I said, hey, but you didn't have to do anything. How many hours did you save, right? By handing this off to your partner. So you've got to recognize that those hours are precious and important, even if your partner's not going to do quite the job that you would. Yeah, I do. You know, and, and we've been talking a lot about partners and even fair play. Um, you know, we, we have a great question from Rebecca. As a solo parent, all decisions fall on me. Any suggestions for finding a sounding board for decisions? I know we talked about kind of that one mom friend, um, but certainly, you know, I want to acknowledge that par that parents that are doing this alone, um, they, they have to make even more decisions. So, you know, any advice from the two of you on, on how to handle that? Well, you know, I would definitely say the one mom friend, but here's my other question is, why is a partner the only person who would be able to weigh in on parenting decisions, right? Like there are so many other people in our lives whose opinions we value and trust or who really know us that we can also lean on. Um, there are certain decisions like when it came to finding um, a therapist uh, for my son, I, anytime I brought it up with my husband, it would like, he would kind of flip out like it just was something he could not handle emotionally whatever so i spoke i found you know i spoke to other friends of mine who i knew had gone through it before and that was how i made my decision i didn't even run it by my husband because he's he's not this is something he wants no part of um i guess a little weaponized incompetence there um and so i think that we sh we can expand our ideas of who we're getting advice from who the trusted source is um, in, in those cases. I love that. Um, I'll take one more and then I'm gonna, I'll start to wrap it up. Um, but I think this is a great one. I make so many decisions at my full-time job at the hospital and send my toddler to daycare. But during the free time that I have, I don't care to think of craft, et cetera. I'm, I'm so dead while pregnant again. Does it really matter how I spend time with my kid in the grand scheme of things? No. <laughs> Thank you for, I, I love that we just made that decision for you. There yeah, you go. Yeah, decision yeah. made. Done. You know, I, you know I, I think honestly, like, and this is where, again, quieting the noise of social media is so important because we are just told that every aspect of parenting is perfectible, that you have to spend time with your kid in a certain way, that you have to engage with your kid in a certain way, that you have to be the like crafty Pinterest parent or that you've got to do what's best for you and for your family. Um, and that varies widely from 
person to person and from family to family. And one of the things that I think is really tough uh, for parents now is that they're given these a lot of advice, but they're given advice largely from these quote unquote experts who've never met them, who don't know them, who don't know their particular circumstances, who don't know their kids' particular temperaments and personalities, nor theirs. Um, and so these experts can't possibly weigh in on you personally. And you've got to trust yourself and your own instincts and, and trust that you're giving yourself and your kids what you and your kids really need. Um, yeah. That's the bottom line. I love it. I love it. I, and I think that's such a great way to wrap this up. Um, I want to really thank everybody for being here today. Um, both of our panelists, if you want to even just drop your, um, your handles into the chat and, and then everybody can make sure they head over to Instagram, follow you. Um, I would definitely suggest looking up, um, Dr. Elise's, um, decision fatigue article that she wrote for the Washington post, such a great piece, um, as a little resource, chat, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if, Oh, I see your, I see. Yes. Everything. Oh no, you just put it to host and panelists. So put it in the chat to everyone. Oh, oops. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, go ahead and find them um, here at Vivi. We are um, trying to do, you know, more webinars and create content that, that will help you hopefully with some of these big parenting decisions. Um, so make sure you come over and follow us. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing you all next time. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. All right. Have a great day. Bye everyone. Bye.